And g'day mate, Luke Ford here with Professor Stephen Turner. Dr. Turner is an author of many books, including in 2018, Cognitive Science and the Social, a primer. In 2013, he published Explaining the Normative. He also published a book on Emil Durkheimer, sociologist and moralist, a book on the politics of expertise, uh, the search for a methodology of social science, Durkheim, Weber, and the 19th century problem, of course, probability and action, uh, sociology, sociological theory in transition, the Cambridge companion to Weber, understanding the tacit, the social theory of practices, tradition, tacit knowledge, and presuppositions, the Sage Handbook of Political Sociology, the Sage Handbook of Social Science Methodology, the Blackwell Guide to the Philosophy of the Social Sciences. Uh, Professor Turner, what led to your interest in Carl Schmitt? Well, it's, uh, it began really with the problem of, um, I actually began in a birthday party and I was chatting with a friend who was a, a political uh, scientist. And he, um, I was reading Habermas, he was uh, reading Strauss, and we noticed the curious similarity between the arguments, really, that there were parallel arguments just in somewhat different form. So we started tracing back, the, and these were arguments against Weber, basically, and against value freedom. Uh, and uh, we just started tracing back perception history of um, ideas, and that re led us to, the, among many other things, to the, the Schmidt controversy. So the Schmidt controversy really, um, you know, the, the, the sort of the high point of it is the Weber's centennial in 1964, and Habermas uh, says that uh, Schmidt is a natural son of Weber, so that uh, fit with a kind of um, argument that has been Developed by Wolfgang Mommsen in that's 1959, very influential dissertation that Weber, by of being nominally a liberal, was really a precursor to fascism. So Schmidt was then the connecting link, and uh, since Schmidt was you know, publicly at least at that time, although privately is a different matter, regarded as you know, the Nazi theorist of law. That, that was a mark against Weber and therefore uh, uh, stigma. So, uh, yeah, we discussed that in, in the book that we did on that reception history, and then we got into um, uh, more discussion of that Weimar era set of uh, arguments. And from that, uh, it led to lots of other things. So Morgan Thau, who had a uh, complicated relationship with uh, Schmidt, who started as evil, but nevertheless took a lot from. And that was the case with a lot of other people, it turned out. So you we find the Schmidt influences all over the place once you started looking for them. So was it 1964? Was that the year you first became interested? No, that was, yeah, it was, uh, uh, something that came up afterwards, after we started looking at this history. So that was, that was a pivotal event in history that we were looking at. So what year was it that you became interested? Well, it would have been in the late uh, 70s, when we were you know, just beginning to publish in this area. And that coincided with other people like uh, Joseph Bendersky and uh, Ellen Kennedy. It was a very small group of people who were talking seriously about uh, Schmidt at that point. Um, so we were not really in the, the center of that discussion. We were, you know, looking at more at Weber, but um, um, we all talked to each other. Uh, and that was really the point where you got the scholarly interest in Schmidt, and uh, at least in discussing Schmidt, as opposed to this earlier emigre generation and uh, their contemporaries who were uh, um, you know, still very much caught up in this condemnation of 
Schmidt. And did uh, Paul Gottfried's work on Schmidt hold any interest? Oh, I don't know that book. Oh, okay. So I want to read a sentence from uh, Casey's introduction to the concept of by the University of Chicago, uh, Tracy B. An intellectual consequence of Nazism effectively think, perhaps one might say, homogenize language in right yeah it uh it meant that um a liberal democracy with its premises were more or less unchallenged and used in discussion without you know the, the only outsiders were the real left and uh, people who were basically communists or Marxists, and everybody else was pretty much in this other uh, category, except then you start seeing the exceptions. So it's Straussianism and so forth, and they, but they operate on a, a difficult, a different level, and nominally endorse liberal democracy and so on and so forth. So, so it's definitely right that it. it gets constricted to that. And then later that breaks down. So what are some other examples of uh, how political discourse has been homogenized by, uh, since 1945, where, in other words, that the things that we can discuss publicly has been reduced? Yeah. I think it's more it's a more positive uh, effect of the way in which these academic disciplines develop because you don't really have uh, a category called democratic theory prior to the war, and uh, you don't even have a sort of professional field of political science in most countries uh, prior to the post war period where uh, they become Americanized and then they just follow a kind of uh, uh, disciplinary definition that uh, is more or less imported from the U.S. So that becomes the standard of um, uh, professional discussion. Yeah, I have a friend who argues that politics died in Hitler's bunker. In other words, that the elite saw that the working class could no longer be trusted in matters of politics. Is there anything to that? Yeah, well, I uh, I wouldn't quite put it that way, but it, you know, the, I think it's more you know a problem on on the other side that. Um, um, during the 30s and then the post-war period, these socialist parties actually got a chance to uh, be in power. And just as in the Weimar Republic, they decided, well, we can't, we can't really do socialism. We, it's not time, it's not right, but we can do something in between, which is the welfare state. We can expand it and uh, so on and so forth. And, uh, um, you know, that was partly based on just reality. Uh, so in the UK, Tawney was, you know, the big Christian socialist uh, uh, thinker, and uh, he just said, "Look, you know, if we redistribute everything, there's not going to be that much for anybody. The best thing we can do is give generous public services, and that's pretty much the way it uh, turned out." But nobody envisioned the welfare state on the left as the goal. It just happened that that was the goal that they could actually achieve. Uh, as the reaction to Nazism, has it restricted, for example, the way we're allowed to talk about issues such as immigration? Uh, probably. Um, you know, anything involving, you know, obviously the race is the, the real uh, thing that we... <laughs> can't talk about, and that was the result of uh, kind of, uh, of, A, a lot of effort, 30s of uh, changing the discourse on race in response to Nazism, and then after the war, it became the sort of UNESCO doctrine of racial um, 
pluralism and equality, which, uh, um, yeah, it just made it very difficult for people to talk about race. And then there are all these race biology institutes and so on all over the place. They had to be re renamed and uh, uh, restructured. So get, getting that out of politics, that was, yeah, that was an important uh, uh, change. Uh, Schmitz uh, asked them, friend, enemy, distinction, is it, is it possible in, say, a multinational nation state like the United States of America for Americans to be in a friend, enemy, distinction when there's almost nothing that Americans have in common anymore? Yeah, so I think this argument actually goes back to uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson. And he, and it's it's really very much Schmidt's argument, but in a much simpler form. And it's a basic idea is that well, if you have the will of the people, you have to have a people. And in the United States, because of pluralism, you don't have a people anymore. And so uh, Wilson's argument was, therefore, you can't have all of these elections and all this decentralization because that just leads to corruption and machine politics and all that sort of stuff you have to have centralization that pluralism means state centralization and an expanded administrative state and fewer elections and so on and so forth um so yeah i think that's a kind of that's an anti-democratic uh argument um but it's it's the argument of one so I've been reading uh, Tracy Strong's book, Politics Without Vision, Thinking Without a Bannister in the 20th Century, and he writes, uh, many of the distinctions that political theorists and liberal thought in general have after 1945 drawn between thinkers are, in the end, answers dependent on a tacit question, what is the relation of this thought to the Nazis? You think he's right? Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That that's definitely still there. That's the uh, you know Leo Strauss called this the argumentum ad Hitlerum that Hitler had these views, therefore they're wrong. I think that's still a powerful part of the discourse. Okay, so Schmidt believed that democracy would require a homogeneous population. So what would Schmidt say about a multi-nation state like the United States today, which believes it's the embodiment and even the perfection of democracy? Yeah, well, Schmidt's very uh, complicated on this subject. So he, he definitely thinks that if there are two groups that identify themselves as nations, they can't be combined into a, a democratic structure because uh, you need a people to authorize the, the uh, state, uh, the, the legal state. But he also is quite uh, uh, consistent in thinking that there are contradictions between liberalism and democracy. And uh, the so he, at least in the extreme, and but it, thinks that in reality, uh, they work out a kind of accommodation. And the accommodation is something like an agreement uh, on how to resolve disagreements. And so, uh, so democracy, purest form requires unanimity, means no disagreement. It doesn't require any liberal discussion or compromise or contractual deals between parties um, and liberalism that's all about making these contractual deals it assumes disagreement uh, is a, you know presents itself as a solution to the problem of, uh, of disagreement so he said he thinks that you know Rousseau is the democratic guy and uh, liberalism is something um, uh, different but in practice uh, you get both, but you need a certain amount of agreement on the rules of the game uh, in order to have liberalism. So that's where the democratic part comes in. So you, if you have two 
multiple groups that don't agree on the rules of the game, then you've got a problem. And that was the problem that he saw with uh, the Weimar Constitution, where you had anti-government parties that didn't agree with the rules of the game. And you had so many of these and such powerful ones that uh, either they had to be suppressed or you just couldn't go on. Okay, uh, you wrote, uh, what does one have when there is such a gulf between the worldviews of the major parties that public persuasion is no longer possible when some of the parties, including the rising ones, are fanatical followers who are unwilling to accept the reasonableness of the views on the other side. One no longer has the conditions for liberal democracy. And in this context, it makes perfect sense to speak, as Schmidt did, of the democracy that results from voting in these circumstances as the tyranny of the 50% plus one. Uh, that sounds like America today. Yeah, sadly, uh, it does. I think we don't really know what um, what underlying unanimity actually exists. So that we may be put to the test eventually. I really doubt that's going to happen, but it does certainly seem as though there's a, a gulf of incomprehension between two sides. I look at. You know, people post posting on Facebook and think oh, this is just crazy. Uh, their worldviews are just so non-aligned that there's really no um, way of even understanding the other point of view. But you know that may just be a surface thing that will pass away. Now, reading another of your essays, it seems that you're making the point that the fury over Carl Schmitt in academic circles today is a fury over the political meaning of the 20th century. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, I think that's that's fair. I think there's a you know, um, it's hard to identify you know, all of the sources of that, but uh, yeah, that is a disagreement about the the 20th century. So is it fair to say that the prevailing view in the news media and among elites looking at uh, the political meaning of the 20th century is that the meaning was that uh, we became progressively more democratic and just and that the forces that arrayed against liberalism uh, were subjugated and uh, essentially there is no alternative to liberalism. Is, is that a fair summary of the dominant elite understanding of the political meaning in the 20th century? Um, yeah, I'm not sure there is a dominant. I, I think it's a, there isn't much political understanding there uh, in a coherent sense at all. I think there's a whole set of um, Sort of normative ideas about how the world should work that uh, um, get packaged into the notion of justice, and then you've got those, uh, then social justice warriors fighting for that, and the the elite seeing itself as having a role as uh, bringing it about. Um, but as far as them having a uh, conception of politics, I, I think they're more anti-political. They just don't see the, the they see politics uh, and, and the rule of law as just obstacles that um, uh, stand in the way of bringing about social justice. So what are the alternatives espoused by academics to liberalism uh, from the right today? Yeah, so what do you, if you mean by liberalism, the, the sort of center-left, um, say, the Democratic Party? No, I mean the classical idea of uh, democracy, equal rights, classical liberalism. Are there, are there any academics today who propose an alternative outside of the realm of classical liberalism on the right, right-wing alternatives to this? I, yeah, I can't think of any you know, real traditional right-wing um, alternatives. I think um, you know, there is obviously a body of conservative uh, political thought which 
sees those um, uh, rights in more, you know, what Schmidt would say, concrete or you know, substantive terms that, that they have to mean something, and uh, that then the meaning that uh, they have has to come from some kind of shared tradition or something like that. I mean, that that's not an uncommon view on the right. So their their concern about liberalism is really uh, political sustaining the political culture of liberalism and the, the anxiety they have is that uh, legal changes and so forth undermine that system, that uh, sense of you know tolerance and uh, so on that is essential for liberalism so in particular I think they, they're concerned about things like you know if you get rid of the notion of merit you get rid of various traditional notions of fair play that are dualistic and place that by um, uh, ideas about group rights, then you pretty much undermine the idea of uh, uh, some of the basic ideas of how we get along with each other. Are there any academics promoting fascism as an alternative today in the Western world? <laughs> I can't. I can't think of any. But I, you know, I, I think there are people on the left who are. Uh, I think, especially in French political thought, these former or maybe continuing Maoists that have, uh, you know, pretty much uh, some pretty radical views on how you need to transform pro politics to uh, turn it into, uh, um, you know, basically it's, it's a social justice uh, campaign. I think the, the critiques of politics that you find in most of these places are that it just doesn't bring about social justice, therefore we need something more powerful. Is there continuity in Carl Schmitt thinking or does it change radically in response to different situations? Well, I think there's a lot of continuity, but he also you know, decides once he uh, thinks that uh, um, the liberal democracy is done for. I think when he starts looking at totalizing parties, he's also looking at some concrete phenomena of European political life at the time, and that was that these were totalizing parties. So they... Uh, you know, if you were a Nazi, you joined a Nazi motor club, you, you know, were, uh, went to the Nazi bars, you hung out with Nazis, and then the same on the left. So you've got um, people in contemporary politics who were brought up in the communist world. They went to communist day camp, they went to the communist summer camp, they, <laughs> they hung out with communists and uh, um, it was a total uh, identification. So you don't really have parties like that at the moment, and uh, thank God. Um, but um, it, they're always possible. It's just, it's. But it was uh, a major fact of life in the Weimar Republic. Uh, if Schmidt had never joined the Nazi party, let's just say he left Germany in 1932, uh, would the substance of his political theory be much different? Yeah, that question really, I think, is, you know, what are, what are the underlying uh, motivations here? And I think the underlying motivations have a lot to do with uh, uh, religion. So, at least with the al religious alternative. And so I think what he's haunted by is really a, um, a 19th century problem of, um, that in England was um, discussed in terms of how will people be moral if they don't believe in hell. <laughs> so Sch Schmidt uh, understands that there is a politics of uh, 
or a political theology that is posits higher goals than worldly goals, and that that's uh, um, a legitimate alternative that puts into question liberal democracy. Liberal democracy is a with uh, this worldly doctrine. Uh, you can't rule out otherworldly doctrines, and you can't rule out those doctrines being uh, um, part of politics, and also uh, that it's a legitimate question of politics should uh, the state save people's souls by, say, protecting them from pornography or whatever. And he, he just... Um, Rather, I don't think he decides that question, uh, but he thinks that that's foundational. It's hard to see much continuity between uh, the essential worldview of Nazism, which is really based on race, and Schmidt, because Schmidt was not interested in race. Right. Yeah, that's right. That's... Um, the conventional view, and I think that's that's right. He is, though, interested in um, the politically problematic claims of sort of ethno-nationalism. So, if if you've got a, a minority that essentially rejects the um, sort of democratic consensus or the consensus that's necessary to support a constitutional state, then he thinks there's a problem. So he's aware of the existence of these groupings. Right. It seems really weird to call Schmidt a Nazi thinker in that there's really almost no connection between uh, Nazism, the, the essential worldview of Nazism, and Sch Schmidt. Well, it's always a problem to figure out what the essential worldly view of Nazism is, and uh, well, it's biological it's struggle. It's, you know, that's race yeah. is real, well, and that, it, if that's the core to it, then yeah, there's no particular connection. And yet, he's always, you know, Schmidt the Nazi. Uh, that's like the probably the most common referent to him. Well, he signed on. He met, joined the party. He uh, took. Uh, the benefits of being associated with, although they never really trusted him. And he, he articulated um, uh, a view of international politics that was um, not really theirs, but which, which justified this kind of uh, um, dominance over your near neighbors, the, sort of the Putin view of politics. Yeah, well, um, the, the realist view of politics. Well, it's not really realist because for him, the issue was uh, you didn't really have a right to dominate the people who were far away from you. You just had a right to protect yourself by, you know, encircling yourself with subordinate uh, powers. So, say the U.S. going into Afghanistan, that would be a complete violation of the, his model of uh, of politics, and his picture would be that, well, there are multiple spheres in the world and they have buffer states around a uh, core uh, country. And they get along because they don't attack beyond their own borders, except to these buffer states. Well, in other words, he signed on to the, the Monroe Doctrine, but for other... It, it actually, actually, he repeatedly cites this. Right. I mean, if, if it's good for the goose, it's good for the gander. If America can have a Monroe Doctrine, then why can't a powerful Germany or a powerful China or a powerful Japan? Yeah, exactly. No, that was exactly his view. And so there's nothing more Hitlerian about that doctrine than it is American. No, but it was certainly tailored to the geopolitical situation of Germany. So, uh, But yeah, only in that sense was it. Hitlerian. Now, I, I wonder if a, a if Karl Schmitt's thinking would have emerged if he'd lived in an island state such as England or a state with no immediate enemies like the United States. It seems like his 
his thought is in large part produced by his circumstances, and the circumstances are that Germany during the 1920s, 1930s was surrounded by potentially hostile powers, and that Germany had no, you know, natural defenses uh, such as the United States has with the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. Yeah, I think in some respects that's true, but I, I think there are a lot of similarities between um, Schmidt and Woodrow Wilson. So the Wilson didn't have that excuse. Now that's fascinating, and that's something that uh, Tracy Strong wrote about in his book Politics Without Vision, Thinking Without a Bannister in the 20th Century. And I'm just going to try to pull that up here. So he talked about how... Uh, yeah, let me just read this to you. Uh, the politics pursued by Woodrow Wilson and Vladimir Lenin were not only remarkably like each other in their conception of what politics was about, but also radically different from those pursued by Clemenceau, Lloyd George, and most of the other leaders at Versailles. Clemenceau and his friends wanted to make sure that war never got out of hand again, as the Great War had. They wanted, therefore, to make sure that the waging of war remained in the hands of and for the purposes of the elite. Woodrow Wilson and Vladimir Lenin sought rather to remake the very stuff of politics in Wilson's famous phrase when asking Congress to declare war to make the world safe for democracy. And as world history developed, it favored Wilson and Lenin. The war involved the population as a whole. It was total. For Wilson and Lenin, the purpose of war was to extend certain social relations, that is to make concrete and universal Dynamics potentially inherent in political and social development since the French Revolution. What do you think? Yeah, I think that's uh, especially that last phrase is right because the principle of self determination was the Wilsonian doctrine. And the idea was that uh, uh, democracy is only safe in a world of democracies, meaning a world of self determining nations. And of course, that's what caused so much trouble in Eastern Europe because you had these uh, um, nominal nations with minorities that were ethnically and linguistically, religiously different, and uh, they had lots of trouble making those work. Now, this is hilarious because most people would be like outraged if you said that uh, Woodrow Wilson and Vladimir Lenin had a similar worldview. Well, I think they both had the same view that the world had to be politically more or less homogenous in order for it to be peaceful. Yeah. <laughs> I don't think most people realize. I mean, some some people who think about the issue deeply do. But uh, let me get back to... Uh, Tracy here in his book Politics Without Vision. What then was the source of Karl Schmitt's attraction to Hitler? It was pretty clearly not an admiration of the particular qualities that the man had, even if one discounts the occasion. The disdain Schmitt expresses during his interrogation at Nuremberg is palpable. One might rather say that Hitler appeared to him something like the entity God had sent to perform a miracle and that the miracle was the recovery of a this-worldly transcendence for sovereignty and thus the human realm of the political. From this understanding, the person Hitler was nothing important and Schmidt's relation to it could be only the relation one has to a miracle acceptance or rejection. What do you think? Yeah, I'm not sure about the miracle part, but I, I think it was uh, Schmidt saw this as an inevitability, and he was certainly not alone in this. When people... Uh, uh, even people who were opposed to Hitler in a few years, they said, well, uh, I give up. This is this is the way it is. This is the way it has to be. Yeah, I'll read a little more here from Tracy Strong. Uh, this is all the more likely as very rapidly Hitler seemed to many to behave like a true statesman in times of exception, legally elected, but or end capable of making the hard extra legal decisions that were necessary. When in the midst of increasingly public conflict between various factions of the party, Hitler ordered the execution of all the leadership of the st stormtroopers. Within two days, almost all the press was congratulating them on saving the country from civil war. Schmidt published a month later a newspaper article, The Fuhrer Protects the Legal Order Defending Hitler's Actions. Thus, it is the reality of taking power and manifesting sovereignty in the use of power that attracted Schmidt. His understanding of law required that he support Hitler. It was not a question of summing, succumbing to the charisma of a prophet, true or false. 
Yeah, no, that's definitely right. So Schmidt's idea, this is really goes back deeply rooted in uh, uh, German constitutional thinking because their big problem in the late 19th century that really leads to Schmidt is sovereignty. And the question is, is sovereignty about the king or is it about the law? And does the law authorize the king or does the king authorize the law? And Schmidt comes down on uh, the law is not enough. And Kelsen is on the other side that the state is the law and no more. And so for Kils uh, for uh, Schmidt, the idea that you protect the legal order by uh, extra legal uh, authority, that's absolutely central to his conception of, of relationship between the notion of sovereignty, relationship of authority to the law. Okay, a little more um, from Tracy Strong. Uh, Schmidt thought the enemies of the regime, uh, I lost my place, were in fact necessarily enemies of what it meant to be German. And uh, that's Essentially, if Schmidt was to be consistent with his thought prior to 1933, he would have had to have signed on with the idea that the Fuhrer protects the law. Is that accurate? Yeah, I think that's, you know, uh, more or less, you know, it's true. Uh, but if you if you're go in for this doctrine of sovereignty and you want to protect this, you think the state has a right to protect itself, and the leader has a responsibility to protect the state, then that's what you have to do. Uh, Schmidt had more regard for Thomas Hobbes as a political theorist than any other thinker. Is that accurate? Yeah, he was described as the Hobbes of the 20th century. And his big disagreement with Hobbes had to do was really a sort of Catholic disagreement where he thought that Hobbes allowed freedom of conscience and that was a mistake that the state really had responsibility for people and this goes back to their responsibility for people's souls uh, but allowing freedom of conscience was that this allowed the, the disruptive element that led to the uh, end of the, the state so Schmidt's very concerned with the demise of the what he thinks of as the true state and that liberalism is one of the solvents and uh, conscience is one of the core notions of liberalism. Yeah, it's fascinating to have an intellectual make the case against freedom of conscience. I, I never considered that there was a case against freedom of conscience. <laughs> well, you, you find this in Auguste Comte as well. Uh, in astronomy, there is no freedom of conscience. And he says that's the, that should be the model for the state as well. It should be done scientifically. And uh, are there any intellectuals today making the case against freedom of conscience? Oh, uh, that's, uh, I think it's certainly a concealed case. If you're a, um, a social justice warrior, you think that uh, many people are afflicted with false consciousness and misrecognition, so on and so forth, and they need to be reformed. They don't, they're not allowed to you know, hang on to their errors in the name of conscience. And that, or of course you see this actually in this overtly in issues about the religious conscience and medical practice and so on. Uh, Schmidt said many things that just completely blew me away. Uh, one of them was that the the most important thing that Hobbes said was uh, Jesus is the Christ. I mean, <laughs> I, I just can't imagine that. But why to Schmidt was this so important? Interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That gets into a, more theology than I'm really prepared for. But okay. I think there is this doctrine of the the uh, incarnation that is uh, really important for uh, any religiously inclined thinker, uh, and it's really com comes up a lot in the the um, 
19th century. And um, so, um, and it means that we have an obligation to create the kingdom of God on earth, or we have to carry out God's will on earth. And that's the, uh, you know, that's a theological idea that, that God is here in the world. Now, did uh, Schmidt believe in God? Oh, I think so. Yeah, sure. What what God he believes in, what kind of God he believes in, that's a more interesting question. Does he believe in the God of uh, the Roman Catholic faith? I think he sort of believes in the God you find in Job. Ah, uh, deist? Well, he, that he's a... Uh, terrible and, and uh, uh, not terribly understandable, but powerful being. I think that's <laughs> my guess as to what his fundamental view is. So he, he doesn't particularly believe in the uh, the nice God. Now, how could Schmidt be a Catholic and not believe in universal morality? Yeah, so this is, uh, I'm not sure he doesn't believe in, uh, universal morality then is, is kind of a natural law doctrine. Mm -hmm. And so he doesn't buy natural law. So he thinks that, uh, um, because he doesn't think that the state is founded on higher moral principles. He thinks the state is, is, uh, you know, founded on the, uh, this kind of Hobbesian moment of uh, of acclamation and assent, and um, um, that it makes its own way, it has its own legitimacy, it has has its own powers. Tracy Strong wrote, uh, well, quoting Schmidt, only. A few years after the appearance of the Leviathan, the glance of the first liberal Jew, meaning Baruch Spinoza, fell on the barely perceivable crack, the crack being freedom of conscience. He immediately recognized there the large fracture into which modern liberalism would fall and in which the whole of the relationship that Hobbes had constructed between interior and exterior, between public and private, could be inverted into its opposite. So Hobbes made this tiny mistake, and from that tiny crack, the whole dam collapsed. That seems to be uh, the essence of Schmidt's anti-Judaism. Well, it's the essence of his view of what happened to the modern state and why we're in the fix we're in. So I think his view was that if we had somehow preserved the old form of the state, which was a different form of representation, that it spoke for the people uh, authoritatively without all of this stuff about voting and so on and so forth, um, that we wouldn't be in this, this fix. So I'm not sure that, um, um, how that would connect Judaism, other than the Jews were not really part of that kind of uh, representative state. I'll read a little more here from Tracy Strong. Uh, Schmidt blames the final destruction of the idea of a unified political realm on the Jewish and Near Eastern attitude toward the myths that make such a realm possible. In a recent book, Raphael Gross has made a forceful case for the claim that Schmidt's anti-Semitism was not simply that of a careerist, but embedded in the deep structure of his thought. For Gross, uh, the Jew lies under one pole of each of the binary oppositions that Schmidt works with, the Jew is enemy. The Antichrist, lacking spatial and territorial definitions, definition, these oppositions undermine all notions of nomos. Is there something to that? Yeah, no, I think that is the, the last sentence is, is the money sentence, and that's right. That, uh, that if you have this sort of um, stateless identity that is also political, that undermines the, the workings of the political. Yeah. So uh, Tracy Strong writes, uh, Schmidt's anti-Semitism is first and foremost an anti-Judaism. When Schmidt says that Jesus is the Christ is the most important sentence in Hobbes, he is attributing to Christianity a political quality. It is to claim that the integrity or unity of political society is of central importance. 
say that Jesus is the Christ is to say that he is the Messiah. That is, he is anointed and appointed by God to lead a people and that what he does transcends all law. That the Jew does not accept this means he will always be in contradiction to a unified society for the reason that he claims a source of right that is external to the society. Uh, Schmidt's position has some relation to Hobbes's distress with Roman Catholics who had a divided loyalty. So Schmidt's anti-Semitism is not a biological anti-Semitism. Do you agree with that? Yeah, no, I think that's that's absolutely right. So uh, Schmidt was not a big fan of pluralism. No, and it all he pushes it back to the notion of representation, and so. Uh, he thinks that there are different kinds of representation, and uh, the one that he favors is one that is a kind of authoritative, monarchical, uh, almost uh, kind of representation where the the sovereign speaks for the people and is bound to the people, but doesn't. This bounding isn't a matter of some you know procedures like uh, voting. And so it's a more mystical, but also uh, authoritative uh, kind of uh, representation. And uh, yeah, so if you are outside of the, the uh, this mystical community, then you're a, a problem for it and can turn into an enemy of it. So Heinrich Meyer argues that Schmidt's anti-Judaism had a different source than Nazi anti-Judaism, but led him easily to attach himself to the Nazi position. The source of this anti-Judaism comes in Schmidt's belief that the event of Christianity is political rather than religious. This comes from Schmidt's reading of uh, Hobbes and Leviathan. So Jesus as the Messiah entails the establishment of an earthly kingdom and thus sovereignty. And so Schmidt uh, draws this severe conclusion. The important sentence of Hobbes remains, Jesus is the Christ. The power of such a sentence also works even if it is pushed to the margins of a conceptual system of an intellectual structure. Even if it is apparently pushed outside the conceptual circle, this deportation is an, an analogous to the domestication of Christ undertaken by Dostoevsky's Grand Inquisitor. Uh, right. Could you elaborate on that? Well, I think, yeah, I, I, point that I want to want to make about that is back to this notion of incarnation that was a, a used as a left wing notion and it was the idea that uh, the in promise of God uh, becoming flesh meant that we are all uh, subject to this God made flesh and uh, ought to be carrying out his will regardless of the opposition and uh, but, you know, the left-wing version was that this would bring about socialism. Uh, so this is a, you know, uh, meta-political theology idea rather than a directly political idea. It doesn't imply, uh, certainly not Nazism and certain, or liberal democracy or anything else, uh, it, re it implies our political obligation to bring about a particular kind of world in accordance with you know, the incarnate God's wishes. Okay, let me go back to a little bit more from uh, Tracy Strong. Okay, about uh, the Grand Inquisitor or Catholicism. Okay, earthly kingdoms are godly in that they hold back human instincts toward anarchy and chaos until the second coming. So uh, Schmidt would agree with Hobbes that... Uh, the nature of human life tends to be naughty, nasty, brutish, and short. Yeah. Well, he certainly believes that he's an, not an anarchist, so he, he believes that, uh, you know, government is necessary. And uh, that's, you know, based on an understanding of what it would be like not to have it. But it doesn't, again, it doesn't necessarily, this kind of reasoning, uh, doesn't necessarily lead in a right-wing direction. It also leads in a left-wing direction. So if you go back to the social gospel movement in the U.S., that's what they believed. <laughs> they believed that uh, it was their obligation to lead people to uh, 
this new, you know, the king, the, literally the kingdom of God on earth. Right. And that's got the roots of, you know, the modern social justice mentality as well. These are all, uh, you know, related ideas that there's some higher form of uh, uh, justice that is commanded by something. And you know, it was, originally it was divinely commanded. Here's a few more sentences from Tracy Strong. If uh, Jesus as God will be absent until he returns, we need all the more a Jesus of this earth, a sovereign. Until then, Jesus as God plays no real role in Hobbes' vision of politics. Like the Grand Inquisitor, Hobbes' politicization of theology keeps the anarchic truth of the God Jesus away from this world. This means that Jews who deny that Jesus is the Messiah constitute a threat to Schmidt's entire political doctrine. This is the oldest form of anti-Semitism given a new twist. The denial of Christ as the Messiah constitutes a threat to the possibility of political order and furthers the depoliticization and neutralization of humanity. What do you think? Yeah, well, that's pretty extreme, but that's probably not inaccurate. Of, you know, of... But I think Schmidt is also pretty careful always to keep this on the meta level. So he holds these things out as possible possibilities that allow you to understand the existing order uh, without um, and necessarily endorsing them. Because and, and in a way, there is no endorsement of this. There is uh, um, you're either you know, have faith in this or you don't. There's no argument for it. So Schmidt led a conference on the removal of Jewish sources, or at least the separation of Jewish sources from German law. And it reminds me a little bit of something we have had going on in Orthodox Judaism in the last 50 years, in that 50 years ago, a rabbi on a Saturday morning would routinely give a sermon where he would quote non-Jews, but this almost never happens today. So we have one version of a book on uh, a Talmudic uh, chapter, the, the Ethics of the Fathers, where the first version was written circa 1960, and it had all sorts of attributions to non-Jewish thinkers. Then the second edition came out circa 1990, and all attributions to non-Jewish thinkers were removed. So... I'm thinking that uh, while this, this seminar sounds shocking on its face, it's uh, probably not a phenomenon limited to uh, the Nazis, that as people deepen in their identity, they become more likely to be hostile to outsiders. And this is kind of what uh, was going on with Schmidt and the separation of, of Jewish sources from German law. Yeah, I'd think of actually another parallel, which is the idea of uh, uh, mental decolonization. So you, what you find, you know, a major doctrine of uh, uh, the contemporary left is that uh, uh, all of these ex-colonial regimes are still suffering from the influence of uh, their colonial masters and that the, the positive task culturally is to get rid of these influences. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so is there a difference between morals and values? <laughs> well, Schmidt actually does has a, a book called The Tyranny of Values where he criticizes the concept of values or uh, as a sort of oversimplification and uh, the uh, um, distortion of, of the moral realm. So, um, yeah, the idea of values bound up with the idea of choice, and or either there are these eternal values that are there, sort of in uh, the ether that everybody is supposed to adhere to, or we choose our values. But um, that's a pretty impoverished. Of, uh, of morality, but it certainly fits with a certain cultural moment where it looks like uh, either eternal values need to be defended or they need to be replaced and we have to choose other values. Um, 
So I think it's actually <laughs> most of morality is pretty much tacit, and uh, it's very hard to say how it's conveyed through example and experience and so on and so forth. Um, that uh, so I just think it's right to think this is a uh, a bad picture of uh, of morality. Uh, what do you mean that uh, most of morality is tacit? That you couldn't really, i I'll give you an example. I lived near a uh, um, Greek uh, immigrant community, but, you know, long, long ago immigration, but they're still constant going back and forth. And the political culture there is like Greece. <laughs> uh, and if you were trying to describe it, you could describe some examples of it, but it would be very difficult for you to say how it's conveyed or what it actually is. You see the differences uh, when they when you stumble across them but you can't uh, uh, say oh well it, there's a creed that corresponds to this and it all derives from that explicit creed and the same thing goes for the American political tradition so how do how do people when they behave politically say in local government and so forth um, they behave differently than they do in other countries. Sometimes you can identify some of the sources of, of uh, how people behave politically. So, for example, in Sweden, all of these meetings go <laughs> in this kind of uh, very ritualized order, which apparently derived from the uh, anti-alcohol movement of the late 19th century where women held a particular kind of meeting and so on. This just became the way public business became uh, conducted. It's totally different from what you would find in uh, sort of a city council thing in the U.S. or something like that. And there I think, you know, people learn through um, actual participation um, how to get things done, how to persuade people, what the limits are. And you can't articulate those. Right. So when it comes to uh, an objective morality, it seems that one can only get there through faith. Uh, normally, uh, people would take a, a religious leap of faith. But other than that, uh, the only way you can get to an objective, transcendent source of morality is to make some kind of leap of faith. Is that is that accurate? Well, it gets us into lots of weird ethical theories. So there are a lot of people that, that reject that, but, but nevertheless think that there is a sort of standard list of moral truths that uh, is just uh, are just true, like Derek Parfit. Um, and others say, well, you know, like Schmidt, that um, almost all, uh, Schmidt says that all political concepts are secularized forms of religious concepts. Well, I think that's probably true for for moral concepts as well, um, but more at the conceptual level than uh, as a sort of practical way in which people interact, which I think is just, you know, is based on various other things, um, you know, uh, but it's very difficult to say what this mishmash we call morality uh, uh, comes from. It's the mixture of things. If for everyday, everyday parlance, is there important any important distinction between morals and ethics? Hmm. Um, yeah, I, th I, I think in practically... Uh, um, speaking, you know, people make a distinction between morals being something that uh, inheres in people's subjectivity and ethics as something more uh, rule-based and external, but that they run in, these concepts run into each other. Uh, so, Carl Schmitt's work concept of the political, would you say it's the most important work of political theory of the past century? Uh, well, I think it's certainly one of the most influential, and uh, the influence, I, I think the key thing to drag out of that 
that text is the idea that general concepts uh, can become weaponized and have the political significance of diminishing, degrading, or whatever, some uh, group. And I think that's become part of our everyday talk about almost everything. So when people talk about, say, Trump's racism, uh, they can't cite a particular text that is racist, but they can say that, well, this way of talking about, say, crime or whatever is really a, a hidden attack on some group. So it's been, you know, it's a general concept that's been weaponized and politicized. I think that's now part of people's common way of talking about the political discourse. So it's the friend-enemy distinction, the essence of the political? Is Schmidt right? Yeah, it's it's structured in such a complicated way in Schmidt that, uh, you know, it's hard to, um, hard to say it's the fundamental fact of politics, but the, the issue of uh, if you've got a state, and it's got to define who its friends and enemies are. That's bound up with the notion of, uh, of state and that there is a certain arbitrariness to this. And that, that arbitrariness is the signal of what sovereignty is and what state power is. I think there's something to that. So, um, yeah, when I had, uh, was doing a seminar years ago, we had a riot in town and, uh, you know, it was one of those moments where you see the state being the state, defining who the problem is and how they're going to deal with it. And if it didn't do that, it wouldn't really be a state. Uh, I heard an aphorism that uh, every victimology contains a nationalism and every nationalism contains the capacity for genocide. Do you think that's accurate? Uh, no, I think it mixes up two different sets of concepts. Um, you know, there is certainly, as long as you have uh, the notion of um, self-determination understood ethnically, that's there's a connection. Right. Right. Okay, uh, your latest book is Cognitive Science and the Social, a Primer. Could you give me a few minutes on uh, outlining that book? Yeah, uh, so it's really an attempt to, to give people uh, an understanding of the way in which the sort of two families of views of cognitive science relate to the problem of uh, uh, the social life. So they're in cognitive science, they have this thing called the cognitive science hexagon, which shows cognitive science's relation to different um, fields, one of which is either the social or anthropology, others is linguistics, genetics, blah, blah, blah. And so that the social part is the least uh, developed of those relations, and partly because it raises uh, a lot of problems, and also because as soon as you drag this in, uh, it becomes suspicious that you know, there's some ideological agenda because you've got a conception of the social that you want to impose on everything else. So this is an attempt to look at it from the other side. Say, okay, this is the sort of this mainline uh, cognitive science point of view, which is that uh, the individual brain is a computer-like thing that has to govern the body as it interacts with people in the world. And then any social you get out of that is going to be product of agreement, confluence, whatever, of these independent agents, which sounds pretty Hobbesian. Uh, and uh, uh, then the alternative view is not as well developed, but it's uh, that uh, brain, you know, cognitive, more accurately, cognitive processes 
are intrinsically embodied that they involve uh, extensions into the objects that are will incorporate into uh, uh, mental processes. Um, they're part of the developed and an ecological relationship to the world around them, and so on. And so that view, um, uh, and uh, another aspect of this is the brain is sort of uh, intrinsically wired to uh, empathize with other people. So if you have that view of cognitive science, then your view of what social life is is going to differ. Um, and I know, so the basic argument of the text is that each of these approaches runs into um, pretty serious difficulties in accounting for the social, some of which are uh, well known from political theory, and others are um, just become obvious and try to deal with facts of developmental psychology, and the whole problem of how we understand one another. Um, and so it's really an exploration of those, um, those issues. So I go through all of uh, uh, a whole series of steps of problems, that, uh, like uh, nature of personhood and so forth, from these different points of view. Uh, there's a growing movement within political science on the biological basis of uh, political leanings. Does this field interest you? Have you paid it any attention to it? Yeah, I tried to um, <laughs> stay away from from it actually because the um, um, I think there's in there's certainly a close relationship between this stuff and the cognitive science stuff, um, but the um, uh, way of thinking about uh, uh, evolutionary way of thinking about uh, uh, the mind and culture. Um, uh, it has has its own set of of problems that uh, I am not that interested in. So I, I've concentrated on sort of the other side of the cognitive science coin. Now, sociology used to be a sexy discipline. It has lost a considerable amount of prestige. Uh, what happened? How did it fall? Like this, yeah. Well, that was <laughs> that was another book, The Impossible Science, and uh, there we traced the idea of sociology as a science and its uh, rise and uh, consolidation and its successes, and then uh, um, you know by the eighties and really by the seventies um, it had. Uh, more or less collapsed the idea that you're going to get a theoretical structure and based on empirical analysis and so on that just didn't pan out and what you got instead was um, multiple perspectives so classic textbook called sociology of multi-paradigm science and that sort of reflected that yeah there were just no uh, there was no agreement and there were some different approaches and that was pretty much where we would end up. And uh, at that point, uh, sociology enrollments started dropping. They hit the bottom at about 1986. And after that, they began a slow climb back, but they became uh, more or less associated with uh, women's studies, uh, race issues. And also increasingly uh, uh, explicitly with the uh, social justice. So you actually had departments naming themselves sociology and social justice. So this is a way of um, attracting students, but it was also a, a betrayal of the original idea, which is was to separate those questions out from the actual questions about society. And so now what you've got is a kind of still very divided uh, 
discipline, but um, there's something that's that's called the I think the Wisconsin Compromise, or, or and the idea is that um, for survival's sake, everybody has to live together. So that sort of minimized open conflict, and you've got a sort of heavily quantitative part of the discipline, and then a, a less quantitative part, and a very political part and a not so political part and uh, rather than uh, go after each other hammer and tongs like they did in the 60s and early 70s you know they just uh, say okay we're all in the same boat we don't want to tip it over uh, how's the field of physical anthropology doing these days yeah i just don't know i you know it seems to me that all of the Know, it's sort of constant new news on the genetic front, so it's pretty exciting, but uh, I'm not sure exactly what the role of physical anthropologists in that is. Right, it split off from cultural anthropology, right? Was it 100, 120 years ago that there was this split? No, the way departments organized themselves in the U.S., which was not the same as the rest of the world, was that... Uh, they said, well, we do cultural anthropology, linguistics, archaeology, and physical anthropology. And they all, uh, you know, they still do that. Uh, we've got some applied anthropologists here who are you know, constantly on tap digging up uh, graves of uh, genocide victims and uh, or you know, victims of uh, legal abuse or something like that. So that, that's a practical side of physical anthropology that, uh, you know, still has a lot of, of bang. Now, would it be fair to say that economics is the most sexy social science now, the most prestigious, the most successful? Yeah, definitely. That's the case. So, um, and they're, you know, they've got the most advanced methods and the most uh, uh, power. And it's legislatively mandated in a lot of cases, which isn't the case for other social sciences. Um, but it's not, not everything is happy in economics land either. So. It, it seems like as soon as women pour into an academic discipline, it starts losing its prestige. Yeah. Well, there's definitely a correlation with lots of things, but uh, it's always you know, there's a causal arrow ambiguity there that uh, people may be fleeing these disciplines and rather than just women going into them. Okay, you did a 2013 book explaining the normative. What was that about? Yeah, so that was really about a. Uh, philosophical idea that became really important from the 90s on, which was that there was something called normative force that was necessary to explain lots of things like in, uh, you know, logical inference, but also um, moral reasoning and so on and so forth, and that this is something that couldn't be reduced to uh, natural processes. Um, so what's interesting about that uh, for me as a lecturer of social science is that this was really uh, uh, a kind of reversion against what had become standard views of, uh, of uh, morality and culture and the social sciences, which were that they could be explained in terms of social interaction and, you know, uh, all kinds of other uh, um, causes, and that there wasn't any excess thing called normative force that was necessary to explain these things. So I went back and uh, had to reconstruct the arguments for normative force and show that they were mostly circular, that they assumed that, that there was some special object of morality that could only be explained by normative force, and uh, then looked at, well, how did social scientists, and also in, in Kelsen I used, uh, how did they talk about this problem without invoking 
uh, normative force. So, uh, yeah, so the basic argument was that the uh, normative force people were uh, circular and that, uh, that there was a way of thinking about almost, not almost, but all of the phenomena that they talked about under an appropriate other description that exhausted the explanatory problem that you could explain it without appealing to them. Uh, what percentage of your peers would you say are Trump supporters and how many of them are open about it? Well, what, what you want to count as my peers? However you want to count it. Yeah, well, in philosophy, it's, it's probably, you know, lower, lower than 5% would be Trump supporters. And sociology, probably lower than 1%. And uh, do people who are right of center, do they face any discrimination in the academic fields in which you are familiar? Yeah, that's a much discussed uh, question. So, well, they uh, not go into the fields because they would face discrimination or because they don't agree with the, the dominant view of it. But sociology in particular is very ideologically uh, homogenous. So I would be surprised if anybody went into it uh, looking to respect it as a right of center voice. And so the people who are, uh, I think, um, mostly shut up about it or uh, write in a way that avoids uh, overtly being called out for their views. Uh, so there was a long, there was a very interesting, very important episode in the history of American sociology, where James Coleman was giving a talk or being given an award at the American Sociological Association, and he was shouted down, and there were protesters, and it was it was pretty strong message that uh, doesn't matter how powerful, respectable, correct you are, you don't go the line, you're, you're objectionable. Uh, Leo Strauss wrote a famous book, Persecution and the Art of Writing. Do you have any thoughts on this book? Perhaps its applicability to today's situation for people right of center in academia. Yeah, yeah. I, I think this actually came out in a, a quote from Jacques Rancier, who said, who said that, well, yeah, as, uh, the message of the book is that philosophers in the Middle Ages had uh, an esoteric message that was conveyed only to those with understanding and an exoteric message which would be superficial, meaning that the, every person would um, have. And Rantier suggests that, well, this book also had an esoteric message which was that, uh, uh, unlike the exoteric message, that this is just about the Middle Ages, esoteric message is about now. And that writers now uh, write in this way that they have a message concealed. Uh, can you think of any examples now? Could I out somebody as, <laughs> as a crime uh, thinker? Doing this? <laughs> yeah, well, I I hesitate to do that, other than to say that if uh, there is a, a, a um, a lot of sort of mental effort goes into detecting people's ideological um, point of view, and that uh, there's a corresponding amount of effort of people trying to evade that. Uh, so I don't want to cite any examples. I'm not sure. Uh, I think if they're really good at it, uh, it's hard to pinpoint it, but you, you get the message anyway. Uh, you did a book on Emil Durkheim, sociologist and moralist. Could you tell me a little bit about this book? Yeah, that was a, a, actually a, 
collection with a very complicated history. It was originally um, commissioned works that were going to be published in Italian, and I took over the responsibility for producing the English text, and it was a way of getting a certain generation, especially a bunch of, of French thinkers who won't, weren't usually in were really never translated into English, into English, and uh, getting an overview of uh, uh, Durkheim. So uh, the title was more a product of uh, marketing issues, but the, the uh, point was that uh, um, he he had both the sociological and underlying moral uh, message. What was the moral message of that time? Well, it had to do uh, with his doctrine of um, uh, collective consciousness, analysis of, uh, of modernity. And so uh, Durkheim uh, uh, essentially a collectivist a uh, thinker in the sense that he thinks that uh, you know, people's ordinary moral experience and so forth are uh, greatly constrained by uh, what he thinks of as collective forces and that these change over time and that, the, that people's moral experience isn't really primary. What's primary are these, these larger forces and so he was concerned with, uh, you know, what are the larger forces that produce modern individualism and uh, um, tended to think of these then also as collective forces so that, uh, um, but that you had, there were different collective forces that operated in primitive societies and so on and so forth. But he had a kind of, um, he, he died uh, uh, actually just a hundred years ago almost to the day, and he died, I think he was 58, um, and he never finished his great work on uh, morality that he projected, but he had a student that more or less carried it out, and his argument was that uh, um, start out with very all these different uh, moral orders and primitive societies and uh, eventually they combine into larger societies and they homogenize into a new collective and uh, um, this process goes on uh, hypothetically at least indefinitely until you have a universal world order where uh, so you, instead of having natural law which is there at the beginning laid down by God or whoever uh, you end up with moral consensus at the end through the interactions between societies. So, really, prior to the 1960s, there was there was no notion that there was any such sin as racism. Uh, the Bible doesn't mention it. The Talmud doesn't mention it. The great medieval philosophers of Christianity, Judaism, and Islam do not mention it. The great humanist thinkers do not mention it. The Enlightenment thinkers do not mention it, and then suddenly we have this explosion of this great sin of racism in the 1960s, and now it is taken for granted that it's basically the worst sin one can commit, so much so that uh, even serial killers will take pains to stress that they weren't racist. Do you have any thoughts on this development? Yeah, it's interesting because it, it definitely was not something that came from within the social sciences. You know, I think it was the, the Walker Commission that uh, said that racism was the problem that produced riots. And, uh, that Then it just became gradually part of a sort of politicized academic uh, discourse. Um, yeah, prior to that, um, there's tons of stuff on stereotypes and attitudes and so on and so forth but people just didn't use that term it, it was a term that existed on the left but uh, it hadn't it wasn't mainstreamed right and and now it's the, the reigning ideology and it just exploded in the in the last 50 years it's 
obviously like a top-down phenomenon. It was something decided on by the elites that this would become the number one moral category. Yeah, well, I think you can see the roots of it in the uh, um, you know response to Nazism, but but the term itself, uh, um, you know, was is sort of based on racial egalitarianism. Then racism is the denial of racial egalitarianism, and that uh, that's the worst sin. So I think it's a, a pretty big part of. 20th century intellectual history is getting up to that point. Right. So we can't discuss uh, Stephen Miller, immigration restriction, uh, the predictive value of IQ, all sorts of issues, any kind of public discussion on these things. It immediately goes back to, well, how much is this like the Nazis? I mean, it's really impoverished discourse. Yeah. And you know, there are, you know, philosophers of science like uh, Philip Kitcher, who uh, um, argue that well, that's that's a good thing. That anything that undermines a certain kind of uh, um, egalitarianism really shouldn't be studied. It's uh, um, that science ought to be driven by uh, the right values, and uh, um, that's not the right value. Right, and uh, Schmidt would say, Schmidt would say what about this? Yeah, I'm not sure he would be really disagree with that. Actually, I think he would he would uh, uh, accept the primacy of the political. You did a work, the search for a methodology of social science, Durkheim, Weber. In the 19th century problem of cause, probability, and action. Would you like to elucidate? Yeah, so that was uh, um, an attempt to um, uh, reconstruct the, the origins of the problem of uh, the nature of social science. And uh, so it starts out with Catelet and uh, Comte and Mill, and then looks at uh, and how they juggled uh, this, all these issues about probability and uh, causation and law and what kind of science you could get in social science. And then uh, um, it looked at the, the sort of the next big generation, which is uh, Durkheim and Weber, both of whom uh, employ in, in totally different ways uh, probabilistic notions when they talk about causation. Uh, so it just preps it for the, the so what was really the, the big defining moment where in essentially in American sociology you get uh, um, acceptance of the idea of correlation as a pretty good substitute or necessary substitute for causation and also the idea that you can uh, devise measurements that you can uh, measure things like labor unrest and then you can correlate that with other things and you can come up with a, a kind of science of society. And you did a book also in 2013, The Politics of Expertise. What is this about? Yeah, that's a, a collection of uh, essays over a long period of time on different aspects of uh, uh, expertise um, in relation to uh, political decision making for the most part. So it, it looks at a really wide range of political structures that are uh, administrative structures that use uh, expertise and how they uh, actually worked in particular cases. So for example, it takes a look at the a bomb decision as a bureaucratic phenomenon. How did how was it organized? Why did it constrain people in the ways that it did, and so on? So it's really uh, the motivation for that is really the, the platonic question of how do you relate wisdom and power? And uh, if you can't have philosopher kings, you have to organize it some other way. So we have a huge variety of ways of. 
of doing that. And uh, so that book really is uh, about 20 years of essays on different aspects of this problem. You did the Cambridge Companion to Max Weber. What would you like to say about this book? <laughs> yeah, well, Cambridge Companions are uh, uh, sort of political projects because the, they're really thought of by Cambridge as, as their book and your their uh, employee almost. And uh, there's a kind of um, form that they have to take. You have to get coverage of the major text. You have to have a few celebrities, uh, celebrities in general. And then you have to have, include the uh, you know key celebrities who write on the topic. And uh, so it, it tech checked all those boxes. <laughs> uh, and but you're pretty much the the uh, um, organizer of this. It's not so much a, a, a project of uh, where you've got a goal of something to say. So are you one of the celebrities? <laughs> well, I'm a, you know, probably a minor favor celebrity. Yeah. Um, who are the celebrities in the in the fields that you work on? Well, in, uh, for favor, it'd be people like uh, Wolfgang Schluchter and uh, Gunter Roth, who just uh, died recently. Um, and then there's a, a you know newer generation of uh, um, people working in this area that are um, you know, sort of taken over. I, th I think of this is a matter of there there being a few uh, celebrities, and then there are a lot of people that are very close to that who are really the, the you know sort of the working core of uh, of those fields, and uh, um, those tend to go in generations. Um, so there's a new a generation of Weber scholars, a young generation, and this my generation is sort of fading off into the woodwork. But there's an Oxford handbook on Weber that's coming out. It's probably the, sort of, in some ways, the last gasp of that generation, but it's got some of the younger generation as well. Those are a pretty good indication of uh, who's part of it. Uh, who are the celebrities in the field of Carl Schmitt scholarship? Oh, I think uh, um, David Eisenhouse and uh, uh, William Sherman is uh, good. Uh, Ellen Kennedy. Um, uh, I, I like Lars Vinks, uh, who's really a Kelsen scholar. Um, yeah, I think there are a lot of people who are pretty solid. Uh, then there's there are a lot of people who are uh, for whom Schmidt is a vehicle for promoting their own views, which is I think uh, that's what you find in most of these fields is um, there's a sort of people who are really engaged with the, with the topic on its own terms and people who see it as a way of making a point. So one academic who writes about uh, Carl Schmidt, when I asked him for an interview, he replied, I don't think it's helpful to talk about Schmidt. It just makes people more crazy. What do you think <laughs> of that? Yeah, well, I think that's, that's indicative of uh, uh, this conflict between the sort of the scholarly core and the, the people that uh, use it to make a point. And so Schmidt does definitely uh, upset people. Um, because they see him as the the arch the way of constructing the arch enemy and then putting other people into proximity with him stains them and so on and so forth. That's a kind of of you know, political academic project that there's probably too much of in this world. Uh, Heinrich Mayer wrote a mammoth biography of Schmidt uh, a few years ago. Is he a celebrity in the field? And did you? Yeah, he's definitely uh, he's definitely up there. Did you read his work? I didn't read that one. I read some of his other stuff on uh, uh, Schmidt. But yeah, I think he's, he's a serious uh, thinker.
what's striking is that in this mammoth book, nowhere does it give any indication why so many people find it such an exhilarating and intoxicating experience to read Schmidt. He only writes about Schmidt with disdain. Yeah. Well, I think he probably can assume <laughs> that people have an exhilarating experience with him or they wouldn't be reading the book in the first place. Mm. Uh, you did a book, Understanding the Tacit, came out in 2014. Yeah. Could you say yeah. something about this book? Yeah, that's another... Uh, I, I was quite ill at the time, and uh, I, I felt to, I needed to pull together a lot of uh, of papers that were published in different places so that the uh, politics of expertise and this understanding of Tacit were both uh, collections like that. So that ranged... Uh, it was another you know, 20... Uh, even um, 25 year range of papers and uh, the tacit uh, was a topic that I uh, sort of got into after the my first book which was really about uh, the tacit too it was about uh, sort of culture and how we uh, understand and construct human practices and my point there was that we have access to them more or less only by stumbling over uh, alternatives that are not really ordinary epistemic objects that we can study uh, in isolation from our own starting points. And so uh, from that point on, I became interested partly through the Weber stuff in this problem of tradition. What is a tradition? And uh, uh, what more can we say about um, tradition, and uh, uh, since the sort of dominant tradition is something that's basically tacit, you can't uh, fully articulate it, or any articulation is, is inadequate. Um, uh, my concern in all these various papers was to um, deepen an understanding of what that relationship actually amounted to. So the idea was to save the notion of the tacit, but without turn or make it into a theoretical object, which essentially destroyed it. Then you did the book, uh, The Social Theory of Practices, Tradition, Tacit Knowledge, and Presuppositions. Yeah, so that's really the, the major uh, text in this whole stream. And uh, that was a critique of given that everybody has a notion of what, say, a culture uh, or a worldview or a tradition is, uh, what are these notions? And um, so I divided them into um, uh, sort of mental notions and uh, um, sort of... Uh, non-mental practice uh, notion. So it's worldviews on one side and practices on the other side. And I, and I said that these were both what I call collective object solutions to the problem. So they constructed the uh, culture or whatever as a collective fact. And I said, well, there's basically a problem of transmission here. How does this collective thing get into people's heads in order to influence their actions. And I said, there's not really a good solution to that question, so you have to turn the problem upside down and ask the question of what it is that, what experiences and what actual activities and uh, so forth lead people to think more or less in the same way and be able to communicate and do all the things that these um, notions like culture were supposed to be doing. In 2017, you released the Sage Handbook of Political Sociology. So, what's going on here? Yeah, so that was, uh, um, as you probably know, the, the publishing business is uh, based on um, copying their past successes. So, because reference librarians have money, labeling something a handbook is a way of selling it. And so, a lot of handbooks have been produced on anything and everything and they continue to be um, produced because it works uh, 
And so this one was um, originally proposed as a you know, one volume work, and my uh, co-editor and I you know, worked through the, the topics and realized that just isn't going to cover the, the field of political sociology, which has sort of exploded in lots of different directions over the last you know, 25, 30 years. So we wanted to be as comprehensive as possible, so we ended up with uh, something like 60 different chapters. And we also tried to make sure that this had um, f global participation rather than just being another Anglo-American project. So we partially succeeded in doing that, but it's, it's often hard to do. But we're very happy to get some uh, very good essays from uh, Asia and uh, um, Spanish-speaking world and so on and so forth, which uh, made it a little different than some of these standard handbooks. Well, it's good it didn't become just a, a work of Anglo-America. I mean, we can't have that in the age of inclusivity. No, and it's also the case that there is a lot of talent out there that uh, um, you know needs to be introduced to the the Anglo-American world, which is really distorted by the academic hierarchy and uh, so forth of the Anglo-American world. So it's not, it, I think it's a good corrective to some of the stuff that is not so good in the U.S. and England. Right. I mean, think about all the cutting edge research coming out of Latin America, all the, the development of uh, ideas, uh, not that I can actually think of any. Well, I think that they've been good on things like failed states and so on and so forth. And, uh, um, you know, they uh, are good on charisma and some other topics that they've got different examples to work with. And uh, so you re yeah. really uh, avoid some of the staleness of the, you know, just going back to Hitler over and over again. Yeah, Latin America has a lot about failed states. Well, it's, what's interesting there is that, that uh, some of these states are really good for one part of the state and really bad for the other part of the state. So they're not really, you know, completely failed states. They're partially failed states. It's a very, very unusual um, combination. And you also did the exciting Sage Handbook of Social Science Methodology. Can you say something about that? Yeah, that was another attempt to be um, uh, uh, try to cover all of the different approaches to um, social science methodology, which and we had trouble getting economists in on the game, but uh, uh, otherwise we tried to cover uh, topics that were um, like um, comparative analysis. So what's the methodology of comparative analysis? So you got a chapter on that, you got a chapter on uh, evaluation, qualitative evaluation research and so forth. And these are all, a lot of these topics have their own handbooks. So they're all pretty substantial topics. So the idea was to get this into a, um, a reasonably comprehensive, uh, accessible handbook. You also did the Blackwell Guide to the Philosophy of the Social Sciences. Yeah, so that was uh, uh, there was a Blackwell series that these are really designed as sort of upper level graduate student uh, um, you know, textbook like something not quite a handbook and not quite a textbook someplace in between, and they're designed to be comprehensive and um, so on and so forth. So at that point, we were my co-author and I, uh, co-editor and I, were concerned with uh, philosophy, social science as a, a field, and trying to make some better connections to uh, philosophy as a discipline. So uh, commissioned a bunch of uh, papers that were designed to more or less do that. Is uh, the term social science a misnomer, or is that an, uh, an accurate thing? Yeah, that's a, 
um, it's actually you know, disappeared from anthropology no longer in its official statement calls itself science. There's a big controversy about that. So it's not, it is a, a problematic, uh, but I think what has happened is uh, they no longer argue too much about whether they're scientists or not. It's no longer a particularly live issue. It certainly was a live issue for a period from Comte through Parsons, but after that, uh, that became a, a dead area of discourse. Now, I understand science is awesome and we should all uh, follow science, but it seems that uh, both the right side of the political spectrum and the left side of the political spectrum uh, deny uh, science in, in different areas or deny the, the scientific consensus in different areas. For uh, the left, it's on uh, racial differences. For the right, it's perhaps on uh, global warming. Do you have any thoughts on the way that left and re right uh, deny scientific consensus? Yeah, no, I think that's that's true. If you you know the same people who who will say, well, you're a science denier yeah. it, on one side, or, or if you say, okay, well, take let's take a look at the economic science here. Well, that's not a science, so they're economic science deniers. Uh, and uh, um, yeah, so you know the situation you describe is true. I think what's uh, uh, sad and uh, maybe inevitable is the the um, fact that these disciplines, uh, including things like climate science, which is really not not a discipline, um, have either consciously or uh, uh, simply through acceptance uh, allowed themselves to be separate, uh, made political, and naturally there's a political counterattack once you go political. So that's actually that book, Liberal Democracy 3.0, is, is about this exact problem of experts and how areas, uh, political movements become expertized. They seize on the possibility of expert authority to back them, and then experts become uh, politicized and then hold domains uh, get argued back and forth as to whether this is really a matter of expertise or a matter of politics. And those boundaries shift uh, shift around historically. And um, But it's a, I think a, a, the point of the book was that it's a very recent, uh, or relatively recent, I think there are a lot of earlier versions of this uh, phenomena where um, political movements have to have an expert uh, component that that's a uh, that what we decide in politics now is not so much between say leaders or moral viewpoints but between expert bodies of expert claims you did a book on edward shills so why does edward shills matter yeah i i uh had an NEH seminar with Schills and uh, was, you know, aware of and then became, um, I, I would see him when I went to Chicago, which wasn't that often, but I did uh, have a relationship with him. And uh, you know, really 20 years after his death, we thought there was a good reason for revisiting his uh, um, thinking. And uh, he more or less falls in the same general category of a Michael Oakeshott as a kind of, he winds up as a kind of um, a conservative thinker, or at least one that's concerned about the foundations of liberalism and uh, civil society and whether they're threatened by various you know, changes. So he, um, and also uh, a great uh, defender of the traditional early 20th century, mid 20th century uh, university. So a lot of those issues are are salient today and uh, getting uh, people to reconsider his views 
that's the main goal of that project. So it looks like the only popular book you've written is Liberal Democracy 3.0. Is that fair? Well, that was intended to be a popular book, but somehow it didn't <laughs> didn't work as a popular book. The only actual popular book I wrote was uh, uh, something I did when I was a needed money as an assistant professor called Conflict and Organizations that I did with the guy named Frank Weed. And uh, that was a book that was sold to management book club sales almost exclusively. Um, and strangely enough, looking back at that book, I think uh, uh, even though it was you know, designed as a popular book and had some success as a popular book, it actually has some interesting substance to it. So I, at the time, I was sort of disdainful of it, but now I, I look back at it a little more fondly. Uh, what was the title again, and what was it about? Uh, Conflict in Organizations, and the subtitle was, uh, uh, hold on a second, Man organizations. Practical solutions any manager can use. <laughs> <laughs> when did this come out? It was about 82. And it was really an outgrowth of, uh, I, I went into the dean's office one day and I said, you know, I'm doing so well, I really would like a raise. And he said, well, I can't give you a raise, but I'll give you a way to make some money. And at the time, they were promoting all of these uh, um, continuing ed courses. And I said, well, if you do one of these, you know, think up one that you can do, and uh, we'll market it and pay you for it, and blah, blah, blah. So I did that for a couple of times, and it gave me a lot of material. And um, then that whole program crashed and burned, but I got a, an inquiry from Prentice Hall, which had somehow seen the announcement of the course, saying, would you like to do a book on this? And uh, so I called up my friend and said, "Let's. what do you think? And so we did it, and it turned out to be my only real experience with trade publication, which uh, is more or less like dealing with Hollywood in terms of money and accounting and so on. It's uh, completely different than academic publishing. If you were to write a memoir, which uh, intellectuals would you write about? A memoir of an intellectual? No, memoir, memoir of yourself and your career. Which which yeah. people would you write about? Well, I think, you know, Richard Rorty definitely uh, had a big impact on me, and um, uh, Shills to some extent, J.P. Mayer, um, and, uh, uh, yeah, those were people that were... Um, formative for me, yeah, that uh, I could think with and think against and get something constructive out of. Uh, you did a book, Max Weber and the Dispute Over Reason and Value. Could you tell me about this and that dispute between reason and value? Yeah, so that was the one that I mentioned earlier that it was really about the reception history of Weber's um, theory of uh, value that was the basis of his idea of value-free social science. Um, and uh, the, the point of the book, well, this is in a, a way a kind of Schmidian story. Um, Faber uh, pushed the idea of the fact value distinction against the reigning socialists to the chair and he argued that uh, they weren't really being objective they uh, had a kind of uh, value conception that was driving their allegedly objective policy advice and they should be more explicit about this blah 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 um, but he also used it to uh, criticize uh, professors who were promoting their own worldview rather than teaching their subject and so on and so forth. So this sort of um, turned into uh, uh, a very complicated dispute uh, having in the 20s especially. So after Weber died, there was a big dispute over whether philosophers or scientists should 
lead society by giving them the correct worldview <laughs> or, or should instead uh, uh, limit themselves to uh, uh, the facts and or to not quite the facts but to looking at morality from the point of view of uh, its achievability its consistency values uh, consistency with other values logical and and empirical questions rather than sort of ideological questions and this raged throughout the uh, um, 30s and uh, uh, throughout the 20s and was uh, one of the starting points for uh, the Frankfurt School was criticizing this notion and saying that no you needed uh, you needed to get the correct worldview and that was the Hegelian Marxist one um, so it would, it, this would had a lot of impact. So we just looked at uh, people like Heidegger and Karl Jaspers, who was a bigger follower, and how they are, you know, either responded to or articulated uh, these views of values, and then how it turned into uh, associate, being associated with logical positivism and migrated to the U.S. in the form of uh, the idea of value-free social science. Now, you did an exciting book in 2003, Sociology Responds to Fascism. We know a lot about the sociology of fascism, but how have sociologists responded to fascism when confronted with it in their own lives? Yeah. How courageous yeah. or compromising have they been? Why has this history been shrouded in silence for so long? In this major work of historical scholarship, sociologists from around the world describe and evaluate the reactions of sociologists to the rise and practice of fascism. Woo, scary. Yeah, it was scary, but the, because, because of publishing politics it was only produced in a hard cover at the time so it never had this any particular impact it was really directed as, as against the myth that sociologists were uh, kind of oppositional science opposed to uh, fascism and showed that you know in many cases they were tied to it and in other cases uh, they were completely incomprehending of what was going on did you describe your own courageous uh, battle against fascism? <laughs> no. In fact, I was going to do the the chapter on the U.S., but we eventually uh, had Bob Bannister do that, and I just did the introduction. So, um, <laughs> did you describe any like first person stories of your own like marches against fascism? No, no, <laughs> didn't get into the first person aspect, although I dedicated the uh, um, book to my uh, very early childhood caretakers who were uh, refugees from um, uh, Hitler. Oh, <laughs> excellent. Uh, what are you working on these days? Uh, yeah, I'm doing more on the cognitive science stuff and a little bit on um, uh, uh, some historical uh, topics. A lot on, I've gotten interested in the, the genealogy of anti populism. So I've uh, got a couple papers that basically relate to uh, Woodrow Wilson, the administrative state, and the, the, the ideology behind that, which is uh, um, in which anti populism is a big part. Oh, I, I just read a thousand page book on Enoch Powell, and it was interesting when he gave his uh, speech against immigration in the late 1960s, he had the support of about 80% of the British public, apparently, according to opinion surveys. And yet there was never any chance that uh, his perspective could become law. Do you have any thoughts on how 80% plus of a population can be for something such as immigration restriction, and there'd be zero chance that this can ever be implemented in law. Yeah, well, I think that's you know shows you how politics works uh, and who who really rules, and that's not. Yeah, you know, I think this is what uh, leads to what Habermas calls legitimation crises, but. Uh, um, you know, I think elites 
have a pretty good stranglehold on things, and uh, they don't. Uh, um, they're not very tolerant of those kinds of uh, campaigns, and uh, they just wait for them to burn out. Yeah, I mean, it's it's kind of amazing that in a in a democracy, the people can be overwhelmingly for something, and there is zero chance that it will ever be implemented. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's a democratic oligarchy. Okay. Is there anything you'd like to talk about that I haven't raised? No, I think we've covered the waterfront. Okay. Excellent. Uh, well, thank you so much, Professor. I really appreciate your time. Well, thank you. Okay. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay. That's uh, Professor Stephen Turner. And he has a lot of books on Amazon.com, including Sociology Responds to Fascism, Philosophy of Anthropology and Sociology, American Sociology from Pre-Disciplinary to Post-Normal. So he's a philosopher of the social sciences, Max Weber and the Dispute over Reason and Value, Liberal Democracy 3.0, Civil Society in an Age of Experts, The Calling of Social Thought, Rediscovering the Work of Edward Schulz. We've got uh, Rutledge's International Handbook of Contemporary Social and Political Theory. So I've just become a big, uh, big fan of this professor over the past couple of weeks. Uh, other books explaining the normative, cognitive science and the social, a primer, Emile Durkheim, sociologist and moralist, politics of expertise, the search for a methodology of social science, Durkheim, Weber and the 19th century problem, of course, probability and action. Sociological Theory in Translation, Cambridge Companion to Weber, Understanding the Tacit, really sexy titles here, The Social Theory of Practices, Tradition, Tacit Knowledge and Presuppositions, The Sage Handbook of Political Sociology, The Sage Handbook of Social Science Methodology, and The Blackwell Guide to the Philosophy of the Social Sciences. You look him up, put in Stephen Turner, Philosophy Professor, and uh, you'll find his uh, faculty page at the University of South Florida. Uh, his PhD is from the University of Missouri. His dissertation, Sociological Explanation as Translation, was published in 1980 by Cambridge. He's the author of a number of books in the history and philosophy of social science and statistics. And uh, if you then click over to his website, You'll find all sorts of papers that he's written, such as on expertise, on the cognitive sciences, on the practices of social science, a history of American social science, papers on Weber, papers on politics, papers on social theory, and we've even got pictures. So there are some pictures. Okay, thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.